good early afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Fonagy. I'm uh, head of the Division of Psychology and Language Sciences at University College London. And I have the honor and privilege of uh, chairing this meeting by one of our most talented and best known uh, scholars, um, Kay Jeffrey, who is um, a professor of behavioral neuroscience at the Institute of uh, Behavioral Neuroscience that she heads. And <clears throat> she is also a, a medical uh, doctor, but um, is primarily a neuroscientist who's interested in trying to understand how we navigate ourselves through space, uh, three-dimensional space in particular, and uh, uh, how we get a kind of internal sense of direction. I want to uh, stress that um, uh, she is a remarkably accomplished uh, academic who is a fellow of uh, the Royal Society of Biology. She is a fellow and currently vice president of uh, the Royal Institute of Navigation. She holds a Wellcome Trust uh, Investigators Award. And um, she's also a supporter of Extinction Rebellion. And uh, uh, I believe that she's one of the rare academics who is willing to use her skills and professional knowledge to put her mind to what is probably the most important issue for all of us, how our planet uh, will survive. I know of no <coughs> more important issue, but I also know that this does involve psychology, uh, of which she's a, a practitioner of, and I'm looking forward to hearing your perspective on it. Okay, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, it's, it's really great to see such a turnout, and I'm hoping that that's a reflection of how important we're starting to realize this issue is. I'm stepping slightly outside my usual realm and talking about this. I normally study rat navigation, not um, human psychology. But in the last um, year or so, I've started to engage with this issue, which um, has been um, puzzling me more and more, which is, why have I, scientifically trained, knowing what I know, have been, why have I been so um, unconcerned about the growing ecological crisis? And as I look around, I realize that I'm not the only person, and that Nevertheless, suddenly we start to be, um, within the last year or two, uh, developing an increasing recognition of what's going on. So I've been thinking quite a lot about the psychology of climate action and inaction and putting together some thoughts, and I thought I would take this opportunity to share them with you. So I'm sure that you're aware of the issue. In terms of the, um, the history of life on Earth, we haven't been around for very long. We only really evolved a few million years ago. But this is probably the biggest crisis that we have ever faced. And it's a crisis of our own making. If we, with our scientific expertise, measure the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we see that they are absolutely skyrocketing. So this is a graph of the last 2,000 years. Obviously, it's been estimated for much of that time from uh, various methods. But you can see that since the Industrial Revolution began, where that blue arrow is, uh, we started burning fossil fuels. Uh, greenhouse gases have massively skyrocketed in the atmosphere, and they are increasing um, at an ever-increasing rate. And we now understand the physics of that quite well, and we know that greenhouse gases trap heat. And sure enough, the um, Earth's temperature is increasing. It's also exponential, and it also has really started since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and is increasing exponentially. And scientists who are studying the consequences of this have made pretty clear and unequivocal predictions that if we carry on doing this, then within the lifetime of our children, we're going to have substantially altered conditions on the planet and made large amounts of it much less habitable than they are. And that, this is something that affects 
um, everybody on the planet. It's a global problem. Now, it's not just a climate problem. We also are facing um, ecological collapse. So people who are monitoring wildlife populations, um, insect populations, um, and how the surface of the earth is being deployed for the use of living things and the oceans and so on, um, are telling us that we are um, bringing many, many species uh, to extinction. And that means irreversible loss, not only to those species, but also, again, to our own welfare. So um, with these twin calamities of climate change and ecological collapse, which are very, very uh, interwoven, we are really threatening um, our future, our, our fairly near future. Now, we've known about this for several decades. So in 1988, governments got together and they formed this body called the um, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they said, this is really bad, we have to do something. So if you look at what happened since 1988, you'll see that precisely nothing has happened in terms of um, either our use of fossil fuels, which is driving um, the greenhouse gas um, increase, um, or the actual measured greenhouse gases. So despite the warnings and despite all of the efforts that we've had to develop green technologies and um, carbon drawdown methods and this and that and all of, these, all of, all of this frenzied activity, um, we really haven't had, we haven't even made a dent in the problem. So those of us who are biologists tend to think of humans in terms of us being biological systems. And so it's interesting and instructive to look at what biologists tell us about untrammeled growth, which is basically what we have. And one of the most famous um, scientists to think about this, and really the person who kicked off the study of population biology, was Thomas Malthus, who worked out what would happen if you just allow a population to grow free of predation and disease and all of the things that would normally um, limit a population. And what he showed was that um, populations increase exponentially, much faster than food supplies. And eventually what will happen is that the population will, um, will increase to the point where it's outgrown its food supply and it will collapse. Other population biologists have then kind of drawn in other factors as well. So if populations are living within limited environments, then they start to accumulate toxins in the environment, so they degrade their own environment. Um, and these also limit growth. So there are, there are natural limits to growth. So if you provide um, lots and lots of nu nutrients for growth, you get this massive increase, but the end result in a finite system is always ultimately collapse. And... Um, if you look at what's been happening to human population over the last um, few hundred or indeed thousand years, the picture is pretty similar, you'll see that we are um, on a very, very steep increase. And so that's made some population biologists speculate that we um, are going to, at some point in the future, outgrow our um, system, as it were. So we kind of know all this. We know that we're heading towards a, a cliff, essentially. So why are we just sitting here not doing anything? And there's this really strong sense that... If we were being uh, invaded by um, aliens from outer space, or if there was an asteroid coming towards us and you could look up in the sky and each day it was a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, that we would be completely focused on that and we would be uh, saying to our governments, do something about the asteroid, do something about the asteroid. Why is it that we don't seem to be making our governments do something about the ecological crisis? Why are we just letting this happen? And I have been thinking about this a lot and I think... To, to really understand why we act the way we do, we need to understand that we ourselves are just the product of evolution, the same as any other animal. We are not computing machines. We are creatures that have been designed by natural selection um, to exist within the conditions that we've experienced um, since we came into being, so for the last three million years or so. And um, those conditions that shaped us shape the way we think and we act. So we are, um, and I'm going to show you some examples of, of why this is the case, we are not computing machines that take in all the information and produce optimal behaviour on our parts. We are basically um, talking apes. So when we're thinking about human psychology and how this is interacting with the climate crisis, we can think of three broad categories of psychology. Um, perception, cognition and action. So obviously these are not discrete categories, they, uh, they feed into each other and there are also in fact a lot of feedbacks. But we can broadly think of perception being how we make sense of all the information that's coming in through our senses. 
Cognition being how we organise that information um, to formulate internal representations of the world that will allow us to act adaptively in the world. And then our brains figure out what's the best action and convert that into behaviour. So ultimately we can kind of think of psychology in those terms. So let's look at perception and what psychologists have learned about how perception works. So early views of perception thought of... Um, our perception is, is a little bit like the technology of the time. So um, when psychology was developing at the beginning of the 19th century and you know, your photography was coming along and there was this amazing ability of cameras to capture images. And so visual psychologists tended to think that what the brain does when it's perceiving the outside world is that it makes essentially something like a, um, a photograph in your brain somewhere, on, on the retina or, or in your brain. And it's taken a lot of de decades of research to understand that our vision is really not like that at all. Um, for one thing, we don't actually perceive the entire visual world in front of us. That's an illusion created by our brains. At any one moment, you are only looking at a tiny little spot in your visual field. But you are um, moving that spot all over the place, and your brain stitches all of that together and makes you think that you're looking at a, at a film screen, but you're really not. Um, here's another really good example of how vision deceives us. So if you look at the squares labelled A and B, probably you, you may well have seen this, it's pretty famous by now, but if you were just asked um, quickly to say what colours they were, you would say that A was black and B was white. But actually, if you take the actual pixels, they are exactly the same shade. There's no difference between them. It's really difficult to look at the picture on the left and convince yourself that that's true. Um, but you can see, I've just cut and pasted to make those squares on the right, so you can see that they are really the same. So what's happening is that our brain is using other information to interpret what the eyes are seeing. So it's using information that was partly selected by evolution and also partly learned as you were developing to make some assumptions about the world. And in this case, what it's doing is it's assuming that because of the way that the light is, appears to be coming from one angle and the shade that's being cast by that object, um, the square labelled B is probably lighter than the actual pixel luminance is. And so your brain does its um, auto-correction. Another really good example is this um, very obviously white and gold dress which um, hit the internet a few years ago. Um, because the woman who took the photograph wanted to know um, if it was all right to wear to a wedding. And um, actually, the, the dress is blue and black, so I'm told. Um, but about 50% of people, myself included, uh, see it as white and gold. And this, this um, is a very, very interesting example of the same thing, that our brains are not reporting on reality. They're reporting on what reality probably is, given what you can see and all sorts of other things that we've experienced during evolution and during um, development. So we're really not seeing what we think we're seeing. The other way that evolution is shaping our perception and in some ways limiting it is that we only perceive some types of things. So we lived in a world that was full of predators and so we're very, very good at seeing fast moving things. We can catch a ball within milliseconds, we can dodge a tiger, but we're very, very insensitive to slow change. That's sometimes called the parable of the boiling frog. Um, I looked this up on the internet, it, it is actually a parable. <laughs> so I think people have tried warming frogs in, in a pan of hot water and they do actually escape, you'll be pleased to know. But the parable is that if you put a frog in hot water, it'll jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water and slowly warm it, it won't kind of notice that things are changing and it will adapt to the changing conditions until at some point it realises, oh dear, I'm, I've left it too late and, and, and the frog is gone. Now, how does this relate to climate change? Well, I mean, there's an obvious parallel in this slow change in sensitivity, and that is that because the effects of climate change are so slow, we don't really notice them, and we are not very good at being motivated to act about things we don't really notice. This is an example that might be um, familiar to some of you who are um, old enough to have remembered that a few decades ago, if you went driving down the road for um, a couple of hours on holiday or something like that, you would have to stop at service station every now and then to scrape bugs off your windscreen. Um, what this um, video on the right shows is um, a young driver who uh, just a few weeks ago posted on YouTube his excitement because he was driving and a bug hit his windscreen. That was a, such a significant event, he felt motivated to post a video about it. 
Young, young drivers never encounter the bugs on windscreen phenomenon. Well, there's actually been a catastrophic decline in insect populations in the last few decades. But um, collectively, we're not really aware of that. Here's another really interesting example that um, turned up in the uh, ecological literature a, a few years ago. So a PhD student was interested in the history of this little town of Florida where they used to run fishing trips. And people would pay money and they would be taken on these tourist boats and they'd come back with their catch of fish. And photographs would be taken with them next to their catch and the biggest fish would get a prize. And so she dug out some old historical photos of this company which had been operating for decades. And here are some photos from, from the 1950s, and you can see the people crouched next to these um, extremely large fish. So then she found some later photos. So these were um, from a couple of decades later, and you can see that the fish are a little bit smaller now. Um, they're no longer bigger than the people. They're still quite large by our standards, but they're not, no longer bigger than the people. This is a photo from the 1980s. You can see, again, they've gotten smaller. Um, and then she herself went on one of these fishing trips, and that's what she caught there. So this is a, um, a cultural insensitivity to slow change. People are still paying the same amount of money, and they still seem to be getting the same enjoyment. They're still taking the trophy photos and all the rest of it. Collectively, they're not realizing that what they're catching now is really pathetically small. So we, we've not noticed what we've lost, really. Another difficulty that we have in perception, as well as with slow things, is that we're not very good with magnitudes. Now, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have been warning us that we are um, heading rapidly towards a warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius of the global planetary temperature. Now, they tell us that that will be really catastrophic. We'll, be, we'll have massive storms, we'll have wildfires, we'll have um, rising sea levels, we're going to have this, we're going to have that. And um, logically, I think we all believe them. But even I, thinking as much as I have been about climate change recently, I find it really hard to get worried about 1.5 degrees Celsius, that I just don't know what that means. I don't understand it viscerally. I understand it intellectually. So there's another um, way in which our inability to grapple with magnitudes is affecting how we think about climate change, and that is that um, when we think about how we might deal with it, what pops into mind very quickly are concrete solutions. So um, engineers will say, I know, let's build a machine that will take carbon out of the air and they'll, they'll give you plans for a, for a machine and tell you how it works and so on. People will say, let's plant trees. And there are all sorts of carbon offsetting schemes. You can go and pay a few pounds um, on top of your airline ticket and they'll plant a few trees for you and you can feel happy that your carbon emissions from your flight are being taken care of and that's all well and good. So we find it very easy to imagine trees. So when I say three trees, you can imagine three trees. If I tell you that the global carbon emissions um, for the planet are 40 billion tonnes, and that to offset those emissions, we would need to plant 40 billion trees and keep them alive for 40 years, and at the end of their lives, make sure that they were um, buried and not allowed to decompose and return in, back into the atmosphere, and they weren't allowed to catch fire. So you had to protect these trees for, you know, for all of this time. Your brain probably doesn't know what 40 billion trees looks like. I can't imagine 40 billion trees. 40 million, 40 billion doesn't, doesn't matter to my brain. So I actually tried working it out. And um, at 40 billion trees, if you, if you plant at maximum planting density, is about eight times the size of whales. So that's the best that I can do in trying to understand that magnitude. I don't really understand how big whales is, so, though. So that analogy doesn't work either. I just simply cannot imagine the size of the task that faces us when we try to decarbonize our atmosphere. So the other way that we're not very good at estimating things is our estimation of risk. So we're quite good at doing things like estimating how likely is that person who's following me in the Stark Street to be a mugger or just somebody who happens to be behind me or you know, that, this, that tiger coming towards me, is it going to reach me or is it going to go past and so on. So we're very good at risk um, for certain types of things. But uh, we're not very good at slow risks and, and, and understanding those. And a really good example of this is the differential responsiveness between two very catastrophic events that occurred um, a couple of decades ago. One of them was the Twin Towers attack. And that was a, an, an earth-shattering event. So it was an event that, um, that completely altered the geopolitical course that we were on, and the ramifications of that attack still affect us today. It's, it permeates 
everything that we've done, every time you take an airplane flight and you have all this, this searching and all of that kind of stuff, that all came from the Twin Towers attack. It's affected international relations. So 3,000 people died in that attack. A um, couple of years later, a heat wave swept through Europe. Some of you might remember that um, even in the UK it got pretty hot. Estimates afterwards estimated somewhere between 30,000 and 70,000 people died from that heat wave. And yet, it made barely a dent in our consciousness. Most people barely remember that heat wave. That was 10 times the size of the Twin Towers deaths. And yet, because it was a slow, insidious event, it really didn't touch us. One of them was a predatory attack. One of them was a slow environmental change. We reacted to one, and we didn't react to the other. Now, the literature is rife with um, examples of how we're not very good at uh, calculating risk. For example, risk calculations show this in interest in correlation with demographics. You probably can't see this very well, but um, this is a study where they looked at um, estimates of risk for a whole bunch of um, fairly kind of commonplace events, including cigarette smoking, drugs, AIDS, stress, and so on. Um, and then they looked, they, they divided up the responses as to how risky people thought those things were. According to um, demographics, um, male or female and black or white, and they found that white males, who are the um, answers shown in red, estimated all of those risks as being of a smaller magnitude than all of the other groups. Now, there's all sorts of possible reasons why white, white males may estimate risk differently, but the point is it shows, it shows us that our estimate of risk is not a simple function of actual risk. It's bound up with all sorts of other things. And just out of interest, this is where they put climate change in all of that. So it's sort of um, just above um, coal-burning plants and... Um, Sorry, just above bacteria and food and below coal burning plants. So sort of somewhere in the middle, not very risky. So perceptions are not really reporting on reality. What about cognition, our beliefs and our understanding? So in the, about the sort of first half of last century, the rational economist's model of um, thinking was very, very prevalent. And by this view, so this... This, this kind of view of thinking came about just as computers were coming along. And it's quite common in psychology, um, and indeed other types of science, that we tend to appeal to the technology of the time when we're thinking about how, how, might, how things might work. So people started thinking of the human brain as a bit like a computer. And when you're trying to uh, work out what's going on in the world and decide how you're going to act, what you do is you take in all the information, you do the sort of numerical calculations, cost-benefit analyses, um, you work out what's going to have the smallest cost and the biggest benefit, and you do that thing. So the rational economist model has driven a lot of, for example, economic thinking, uh, trying to get people to spend more money on things like insurance and so on and so on. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, that view was completely overturned by a very famous set of studies by uh, Kahneman and Tversky and, um, and since then many other people. And what they showed was that if you actually look at how people evaluate risks and how they make decisions and so on, you find that really they're not doing um, a rational calculation of probabilities at all. In fact, what they seem to be applying is a whole bunch of what they call heuristics and biases. So you can think of those as shortcuts, quick um, quick ways of thinking about things that, you, that don't require any calculations. And there's a whole raft of these, and I haven't got time to go into them all, but one um, very good example is loss aversion. So um, we have an instinctive aversion to losing something that we have um, to the extent that we would we will work harder not to lose a thing than we have than to gain something of equal or greater value. So once we've got something, we really, really want to hang on to it. So you can think of it as like the bird in the hand worth two in the bush uh, kind of thing. That's what this means down here. So, um, so people show very strong loss aversion. And that means that when you're, when you're evaluating the, the costs and benefits of particular actions, it's very difficult to imagine giving up something that you have. And I think we see this a lot with climate decisions where people think, you know, I know that we should be you know, giving up our cars and so on, but I, I have my car, I like my car, I don't want to give my car up, even though I know that's going to be good for the planet in, in the long run. Very related to loss aversion is temporal discounting, where we tend to um, value immediate rewards more than delayed rewards, even if the delayed rewards are bigger. And a really classic example of this is the, is the very famous marshmallow test, um, which is... Um, sometimes used as a way of studying how children learn to um, assess immediate versus delayed rewards and to sort of categorise people, children and adults, according to their propensity to do that. So in the marshmallow test, a child is left alone with a marshmallow for some amount of time, 
and then they're told if they can last without eating that marshmallow for the few minutes while the experiment is out of the room, when they come back they can have two marshmallows. And, and famously, very young children really struggle to do this, and as, as children get older and more mature, and also depending on personality, they get better and better at it. But this is this temporal discounting, as it's called, this discounting of the value of things that are further away in time, actually runs through uh, adult thinking as well, and it's, it's, it's um, a basic facet of human thinking. And it makes a certain amount of adaptive sense, because if you are waiting for a reward in an uncertain world, there's always the possibility that even though that reward is potentially bigger, it may not eventuate at all. So we have this sort of tendency um, to be willing to forego a larger distant reward for the safety of a more immediate one. You could think of it like that. Now we see um, these types of things, loss aversion and temporal discounting, in um, people's reactions to the loss that they might incur when we take climate action. And we saw this very clearly when President Macron uh, tried to raise fuel taxes in France. And in, in theory, this is something that would be very beneficial for the climate, but uh, for the people on the ground, and particularly people who are feeling economically deprived, um, they could really mostly see that that was a loss to them and they, um, they rebelled and there was a, a big outcry which is still going on. Now it's not just individuals that show this type of thing, you know, society as a whole um, is very reluctant to forego immediate gains for the benefit of longer term gains. And that's partly because governments are made of human beings, I think, and also for the sort of practical reason that governments know that human beings are voting for them and voters show loss aversion and temporal discounting. So the government can say, look, we're going to you know, make things bad for the next few years, it's going to be hard, fuel prices are going to go up, food prices are going to go up, but it will all be better in the long run. They know that they won't get voted back in. Um, there are other types of rationality. So um, a very, very prevalent one is confirmation bias. So this happens when we're trying to evaluate hypotheses. Now this is a very famous test called the Wason test, where people are told um, a hypothesis. If a card is even on one face, it'll be red on the other. Which two cards would you need to turn over to test the truth of that hypothesis? Um, and I always have to struggle. Yeah, I'm trained in hypothesis testing, um, but I always have to sort of stop and think hard about this one. Um, and the answer is typically not, that the answer that people give is typically not the one that's correct. The correct answer is that you want to turn over these two cards. You want to turn over the even card and the not the red card. Um, and the reason is that you want to turn over the even card to see if it's red on the other side. Um, you can turn over the red card to see if it's even on the other side, but it doesn't really matter because that's, that's not the question. The question is if it's even on one side, will it be red on the other? Not if it's red on one side, will it be even on the other? So what you need to do is to turn over the brown. In other words, you need to try and falsify your hypothesis. We don't naturally do that. We naturally look for evidence that confirms our hypotheses. So we tend not to um, look for disconfirming evidence. And we see this in climate change discussions all the time where we tend to be presented with a piece of information. It might be a scientific study, um, and if you're somebody who believes the science and believes in climate change, you'll, you'll see that the scientific study is confirming your belief in climate change. If you're somebody who is mistrustful of scientists, you'll see the study is confirming your belief that scientists are always trying to muddy the water with uncertain data or something like that. So, so confirmation bias um, is a very, very strong determinant of how we form our beliefs. Now, if we're not basing our beliefs on logic, what are we basing them on? So now, of course, we, we do partly use logic, but a very strong determinant of what we base our beliefs on are the beliefs of the people in our trusted circle. And a good example of this, I think we can probably look into ourselves and see, is during the Brexit referendum that we had a few years ago, I will put my hand up and say that when I was deciding how to vote in that referendum, I did not sit down with all the spreadsheets and all of the various things that were going to happen with option A and option B. I kind of looked at the people around me who are my demographic, and they all seemed to be thinking the same thing, and so I thought that too. And then every piece of information that came along that supported my decision, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but you could probably guess, because you know my demographic. Um, every piece of, of information that came along that su supported what we all thought, we latched onto, um, and I just didn't even read the other newspapers. So, you know, I and every other human, we tend to um, form 
many or maybe even most of our beliefs according to those of the people around us. It's a heuristic. It's quick. It's worked for evolution really, really well. Um, why sit down over every minor belief and have to really evaluate the evidence when you can just kind of go along with the crowd? That's not to say that we're complete robots, but it's a strong determinant um, of how we think. And so we tend to form groups of people that we feel bonded to. Now, during evolutionary history, this maybe would have been our tribe, maybe a small group of neighbouring tribes if they were on friendly relationships, um, and maybe our immediate family. So there are these various sort of levels of, of bonding, but we have this strong tendency to form what are called in-groups of people that we feel part of and out-groups of people that we don't feel part of. They're the kind of the other people. And we tend to um, align our beliefs with those of our in-group and set them apart from those of the out-group. And of course, the parallels with climate change denial um, are very, very obvious. Now, one of the um, interesting things about the strength of our social processing is that this, um, this test that I told you about, the Wason test, if I present it to you as a social problem, if you want to find out if somebody, if you want to test the truth of the rule, um, if you're drinking alcohol, then you must be over 18, what cards would you have to look at to know the whether the rule was being followed? And pretty much everybody gets that you need to turn over these two cards. Now, that's exactly the same problem as the one I showed you before. But people sort of understand when it's a social situation that you want to look to see whether the rule is being broken. So when it's, a, when it's a, just a kind of a value-free hypothesis, you don't look for disconfirming evidence. But if it's a rule, you do. It's like we have kind of mistrust built into us. So we're really, really social beings. And when we have sort of social constructions of climate change too. So um, climate change in and of itself is not a political issue, but it has become one because if you look, and there are a lot of studies, but the, the US ones are the ones with the biggest samples. If you look at um, how people, uh, people's beliefs about climate change um, and whether they tend to be aligned with Democrat or Republican um, kind of ideology, you find that there's a big difference in climate change belief or denial. So it's become politicized even though it's really kind of ultimately a factual issue. So all of this kind of stuff has, has made us understand that um, when people are not acting on climate change, it's not because they don't have the facts. So it's not a matter of pouring enough facts into somebody and then they will stop denying climate change and start acting. Um, people's beliefs about climate are much more nuanced and much more um, complexly constructed than simply evaluating facts. <coughs> So then finally, um, let's look at action. So the rational economist view is, that I mentioned suggests that people kind of compute the costs and benefits and they'll just do the action um, that has the highest value for them. Now that does explain some kinds of behavior. And one of the kinds of behavior it, it explains is this very famous scenario called the tragedy of the commons, which um, is very well known. It's been very well known for a long time, but it was really brought to public consciousness by this famous paper by Garrett Hardin called the tragedy of the commons. Um, it was published in the 1960s. And he laid out this hypothetical situation of a village common where the local herders are grazing their cattle. And the problem is that the, or in this, in this picture it's actually sheep. Um, so the problem is that there are too many animals on the common and the common is becoming degraded and um, eventually it's not going to have any grass and all of the sheep or cattle are going to die. Now what's the rational thing for each herdsman um, to do? And... What Hardin did was work through the rational arguments and realise that the rational thing for each herdsman to do is to add another animal. Because from the point of view of each individual, adding another animal produces a big benefit for that person and a small cost which is distributed among everybody. So the benefits outweigh the costs. So each person is motivated to add more animals. But of course the tragedy is that because everybody is... Um, optimizing their own returns on investment that everybody loses out in the end. Now we see this kind of um, commons thinking, as you could call it, um, in a very, very common, um, as it were, remark that people make to me when I start talking about what we need to do globally to try and deal with the climate problem. We need to stop emissions. Very, very common um, remark is, well, what about China? What's the point of the UK curbing its emissions when we've got China or Australia or, or the US or, or you know, all, all of these other emitting countries? So that's exactly the same reasoning as the, uh, the sheep and the, and the cows on the green. It is not in our own best interests to do things that harm our economy um, because our economy benefits us 
whereas the harms from all of those fossil fuels get distributed around the whole planet. So it's, it's exactly the same reasoning. Um, but with um, actions, as with beliefs, it's also the case that we don't always act rationally. Um, oh, I should say before, before I show you some of the irrationality, is that um, some of our climate, in, climate inaction is also occurring because um, our actions are often um, determined not by personal cost-benefit calculations, but by just looking at the people around us and taking our cues from them. And what tends to happen, I think, with climate is that we look around and we see that everybody is living life as normal. So there doesn't seem to be much of a problem. If you're sitting in a cinema theatre and you smell smoke, if you were by yourself, you'd probably leap to your feet and go, where is the smoke? But if you're sitting there and there's a whole bunch of other people around you and nobody's moving, you'll sit there and you'll think, maybe I'm imagining it. Nobody else seems to be doing anything, and so on and so on. So our actions are, um, again, are often sort of socially determined. So um, in very many ways, our perceptions, our cognitions, and our actions, we are, we are not really rational, <coughs> and that is leading us into trouble. And so the question is, is that going to be it? Are we just bacteria, and have we just grown to the edge of our petri dish, and we're going to just run out of resources and poison ourselves, and then we're going to have a big Malthusian crash? Um, or might we be able to actually capitalise on our irrationality? Because there are other ways um, in which um, our actions are, are irrationally determined that might be beneficial. Now, remember that when we evolved, we did so um, because evolution se selected behaviours that um, selected themselves, as it were. It's all very, very circular. And one of the behaviours that evolution has selected in us is that we are irrationally social. So if you look at most social species, they are species where the individuals are quite highly related to one another. So bees and ants, for example, are very strongly related to each other. Colonies of um, voles and so on. Um, most social species are quite highly related. Humans, on the other hand, there are seven and a half billion of us on the planet, and we have this vast capacity to, um, to act cooperatively with people with whom we have no genetic relationship other than the, the random one. So why does, why did, how did that come about in evolution? Well, one of the um, sort of possibilities that, that I think may explain a lot of this is that we have something that no other species has, which is language. And when we evolved language, it, we evolved the ability to transfer costs and benefits among ourselves. So we could say things like, look, if we get together and we both agree that we're not going to put our cows on the commons, then we'll both benefit. Should we do that? And because we have language, we can take the idea that was in one person's head and transplant it into another person's head and get agreement on that. And because we've been able to cooperate in this way, we've been able to build a, a lot of um, very interesting and important social edifices. So about 12,000 years ago, uh, we discovered agriculture, how to work together uh, to, to marshal animals in one place and keep them there. And that meant that we could stop hunting them and we could start to build cities um, and build um, religions, which are organized systems of um, moral kind of codes and social rules and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and we also were able to invent money. So that means that I can take um, a, a loss or a gain scenario um, here in England, and I can apply that to somebody in China. I can say, you know, if I give you this, will you give me that? So language has meant that we can achieve cooperative feats that no other animal has ever been able to achieve. And this has been able to get us further than any other animal has got off the planet, for example. So it feels to me that we stand at an evolutionary crossroads to some extent. So there's two ways of looking at our future. Um, maybe we are just another um, bacterium and we're going to get to the edge of our petri dish and we're going to die. Or maybe because we have this unique feature, this ability to cooperate, this ability to, um, to reason and the ability to get beyond the biases and the heuristics and all of those things and, and actually think what is going to maximise our survival. And it's something that we've never had to deal with in evolution before. And maybe we can get ourselves off this planet and become more than just bacteria in a petri dish. And it seems to me that the choice is ours and the moment is now. So thank you. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh
very, very persuasive. Um, I hope you feel as responsible as I do. Let me open the floor to questions. There are two roving mics. Uh, and uh, any questions to uh, Kate, right at the front here. Thank you. So uh, it's about, for example, the protest, the protest in France uh, as a result for more policies towards climate change. Um, I still do believe that if we have to change, something has to be in politics. But as we see too many counter examples of politicians not being able to do these policies because they're not going to be re-elected re because people don't like this, we're kind of in a deadlock scenario. So is there any way to do something here? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and I'm going to put my Extinction Rebellion hat on for a moment. <laughs> because um, cause this is a, a real problem, that a democratically elected government that's, um, that's behoven to short electoral cycles is really, um, their hands are tied in what they can do. Um, but the idea is being put forward that, um, that the way to get around that is to, is to have um, a citizens' assembly, which is a group of um, ordinary people who are not beholden to voters because they're not elected, and they're not beholden to um, big business because they're not being paid. And their job is to represent uh, the good of the, the ordinary people, as it were, and to sit down. And that, so the idea is that they get together. Um, they are kind of um, selected to be representative of the population, put in a room together uh, for several weeks. Um, they do a lot of research, they do a lot of discussion, they make recommendations to governments, and then they can go to the governments and say, this is what you need to do. Um, I know it looks like it's going to be unpopular, but because we, the people, have said that this is what we need to do, um, the voters will trust us. And this has been used in other situations before, and it's worked quite well. So, so that is one poss possibility where you can, at the same time, respect democracy, but um, also get beyond the short-term um, voting cycle problem. But there's no doubt that this problem is going to require uh, cooperation above the level of individual governments. It's a bit, it is a big problem. But in this case, how would you incentivize these people to actually do something good for the people? How would they actually represent good views? Well, I think the incentive just comes from uh, the fact that we, uh, we as humans care about the future. Um, and I think the hope <laughs> is that enough people care about the future, um, that there will be a, a tipping point in agreeing that collective action is needed. Um, so that's the hope. Whether we can do it, I don't know. We've never really faced a situation like this before. And so that's why I feel like we are at something of a crossroads. Um, but I do think, in theory, um, with our intelligence and our resources and our technology, we might be able to. So when I'm having an optimistic day, I think we can do it. It's coming to you, if you just hold on one second. Hi, do you have a psychological explanation for what perhaps isn't the best term, but perhaps malign climate change denial? Um, we hear stories of people who accept the science, know the science, know that it's real, and in positions of power choose not to do anything about it. Um, well, I'm, I'm just, just putting my popular psychology hat on. <laughs> you, you may have a, more, a deep in, deeper insight. But I, I, think, I, I think in that case, um, it's mainly self-interest. That um, the people who are able to do that have a lot of money and a lot of power and can um, insulate themselves. They've got their bunkers in New Zealand and all the rest of it, and, and so on and so on. So it's in their own self-interest to continue to make the money um, and they won't have to pay the consequences. There may also be elements of denial. I mean, I think it, even malign denial might actually have elements of they themselves haven't really taken on board that this is serious and maybe they don't fully believe it, but um, yeah. Helpful distinction there between malign denial and our ordinary incompetence. Uh, any further questions? Up there. Um, I don't have any background in psychology or anything, but I'm curious if there's a movement in the field to maybe proactively um, counteract some of the cognitive biases that you mentioned, and if research is being done um, in that way in the name of climate change. 
That's a, that's a good question. I, I, yeah, there is quite a bit of research going on. I'm not sure how much it's translated into action yet. Um, but there's quite a lot of research looking at how um, at climate communication, what, what types of messages are going to get through to people because it's becoming very apparent that the deficit model um, is, not, is not right. The problem is not that people aren't informed. Well, so, so, I mean, some people really just lack information, but I think much more it's that people um, are not willing to take on board the information for all of the complex reasons that I mentioned. Um, and so, um, so then there's this... Um, thinking about how to get past that, how to make people trust um, the information. And I don't know of any large-scale formal ways that this is happening, but I think one of the um, things that is happening is the, is the grassroots movement, very much things like Extinction Rebellion and, and other um, groups who are just going out to communities and talking to people one-on-one -on -one and not trying to batter them down with facts, but are trying to kind of understand their point of view and trying to you know, win hearts and minds, as it were. Um, but yes, I think we need um, definitely to be thinking much more along the psychological um, dimensions than we have. You know, we've given a lot of thought to the technology, how do we um, build renewable energy? We've not really thought enough about the psychology and how do we carry um, the citizens of the earth along with us in this, in this thing. Well, it's a good, I'm afraid uh, the other people are going to... Uh, come in uh, to the lecture, and even more important, some people from here will have to go to their lecture. Uh, but so it remains for me to thank you very warmly. It was a fantastic, fantastic talk.